all right hello there welcome back to another we been different video today's video we have what we've been building up to this entire nba regular season first starting out with you know predictions of who's going to do what then obviously talking about you know your weekly nba basketball now leading us to the playoffs and then finally the finals we've had a lot of bad predictions we've had a lot of great predictions you know funny enough last round easily guessed the celtics would be in the finals winning a very convincing series i did not guess at all what would happen in the mavericks and timberwolves series i thought for sure the timberwolves would win in five turns out the mavericks won in five and they didn't just win they won convincingly for of those five games well i guess i shouldn't say convincingly because they were close but come fourth quarter this mavericks team just took over time and time again excluding in game four it was a very very impressive series from luca Kyrie, and obviously all the role players from dallas i'm so impressed with how you know they responded in that series and i again i went on record to say i would be so surprised if mavericks win the series I was very confident the Timberwolves would win in five, and I was proven wrong. And I'm not afraid to admit that because Mavericks played great. Timberwolves, they just couldn't stop them. <laughs> you know, come that fourth quarter, they could not stop the Mavericks. And all through all four quarters of all games, excluding game four, Mavericks were just dominating in the paint. Alley-oop, 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 nonstop. Luka just dishing it out on these gimmies to Daniel Gafford into Derek Lively and of course the game that the Timberwolves did win it was game four when Derek Lively was out so like I said I'm I am beyond impressed with the Mavericks now we are here you know the series starts on June 6th game one will of course be Celtics home game two as well and my predictions let me take you guys through it so game one 8 30 p.m eastern time I'm super stoked I think game one will be a close game, a very close game. If you look at all of the Celtics game one, let's uh, give you guys references here, but let's take the Pacers series, for example, game one. The Celtics almost blew it, like bad. They almost just flat out lost to the Pacers, but the Pacers choked hard. Celtics ended up needing overtime to win, but they needed a Jalen Brown uh game tying shot to take it to overtime game one of the Cavs, celtics actually just blew out the mavs game one of the heat uh celtics outright blew out the heat i was pretty surprised all things considered how well the pacers battled even without tyrese but i mean yeah celtics are just really good guessing game one of the mavericks and celtics i think this game will be close but I think the Celtics will have that signature third quarter Celtics kind of momentum. So game one, I have as a, as a very close game, you know, battling throughout. I think Celtics will come out in the lead. I don't think Mavericks will ever have any significant leads here. Uh, Celtics may come out to a stronger lead in the beginning, but I think the Mavericks will easily, you know, bring it back. Reason being is the Mavericks throughout this whole series, I truly believe are going to be winning in the paint. What I do think will be the difference maker between the Timberwolves and Celtics and how they handle the Mavericks is Celtics, for one, have experience in these moments. You know, they've been in the finals before, but not only that, been in the Western Conference Finals last year, you know, only to lose to the Heat. They have guys like Drew Holiday who are championship winner. You know, Christoph Zingas doesn't have experience, but JT, JB, those guys are winning players. You know, they just haven't been able to pull it off completely but they have experience. On the Mavericks side, it's just Kyrie Irving. You know, Kyrie Irving is the only guy who has experience in these kind of moments. Obviously winning a chip with Cleveland, you know, and LeBron James on that squad. But game one's gonna be very, very much a feel out game into how the series is gonna go. But I'm gonna go ahead and go with the experience with the Celtics. Not only that, again, I think the Mavericks will kind of keep it within range but it's just going to be way too hard for them to deal with the Celtics versatility when it comes to not only defending but the way that the Timberwolves were and having some bad scoring droughts 
Celtics aren't going to have that. From position one through five, let's take a look at the Celtics. They got Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday can shoot threes. He's got a very, very good mid-range game as well. Look at the number two. Derek White. Derek White is a phenomenal three-point shooter. Derek White's also a slasher, just like Drew Holiday too, by the way. Look at the number three, Jason uh, Jalen Brown. Or Jason Tatum. Jalen Brown, though. Jalen Brown. Obviously a phenomenal player being able to be at his best when kind of getting inside the paint, finishing at the rim, but he's easily capable of knocking down the three and getting into a rhythm from three as well. Look at your four, Jason Tatum, sniper. All right, JT is just a sniper and he's a superstar for a reason. Al Horford at the five or Chris Stops at the five. Uh, presumably Chris Stops being healthy. Chris Stops is just a knockdown shooter. Also a really solid score. One through five, they don't have a hole offensively. As to where the Timberwolves, we already know Cat was not showing up, period, for most of the series. Rudy Gobert is an offensive hole. Terrible offensive player. They had Ant, who definitely not used to the moment because he wouldn't go to the ball and go and make plays. Mike Conley is not an offensive player. He's a floor general rallying the troops and trying to get the offense in order, but he's not going to be a bucket getter. And Jalen McDaniels is obviously inconsistent. You look at the Celtics roster, one through five, you're getting consistency one. Two, you're getting a team that is able to do it on every single level in terms of scoring from the three, scoring from the mid-range, scoring at the rim, being good free throw shooters. Celtics are deadly. Not only that, their defense is no joke. Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are able to do some serious work. Drew Holiday being one of the best defenders in the league, period. Derek White being a phenomenal defender leading the league in blocks for a guard and Chris stops his length is going to be an issue now if they try to get Derek Lively or Daniel Gafford in the post up that's not their game Daniel Gafford is a phenomenal rim protector just like Derek Lively and he is also great at getting those alley-oops but they aren't post up kind of guys who are just going to go in and feast so I don't think that's going to be something the Celtics have to focus on too much. What the Celtics will have to deal with, no matter what, is if Kyrie gets going, that is going to be a bane to their existence because Kyrie is kind of the X factor. You know what you're going to get from Luka, right? Even if Luka doesn't score, he's going to be drawing so much attention defensively. Also, he's going to be having a shit ton of assists that Luka, in a way, is always going to have a strong impact. Kyrie Irving, if he is struggling from three, if he is struggling from the mid-range, if he is struggling to get inside, if he's struggling to get into the inside and doing his thing, that is going to hurt the Mavericks so much because he is the X factor. He is if the guy. If he gets going, the Mavericks are looking great. Absolutely great. You know, obviously it's important to get guys like PJ Washington to shoot those wide open threes and knock them down for Derek Jones Jr. You know, it's important for guys like that to show up. Hardy with the very few minutes he has to make a somewhat of an impact and not just, you know, just be shooting terrible shots, be shooting good shots, open shots, you know, to knock them down. This Mavericks team is very rhythm based. Similar to the Celtics, of course, but the Celtics have just have so many individual ISO scores that they can do a little bit more but the Mavericks obviously having Luka even if he shoots six for 20 he's still so impactful just because of the defensive coverage he brings to himself but also his vision he just opens up the court so 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 very much back to game one I will take Celtics game one so in all three series prior uh, they have not lost a single game one we're gonna our prediction is gonna be them continuing that Dallas, to be honest with you, is in a borderline must-win game two just because going down 0-2 against a Celtics team that is both good away and home would be scary. So I would say Dallas, if they lose game one, which again, according to my prediction, they will, Dallas is in must-win territory for game two because it's going to be hard to beat Boston two games in a row. It is extremely difficult to do that. Even if you're home, Boston is just insane to beat twice in a row. Nevertheless, I'm taking Dallas game two. I think Dallas will make it more of a of a tighter series, you know, after game two and being 1-1. Game three, I take Celtics. Game four, I take Celtics. Game five, I take Dallas. Game six, I take Celtics. I have Celtics winning in 
six games. Explaining why I have this the way I have it. Mavericks know they cannot lose under any circumstances game two. Celtics have already shown that if they're going to lose a game, that game two or game three, because of the two games that, that the Celtics have lost, it's game two and game three. I think they will for sure take game one. Game two, I'm going to say Mavericks though, just because they're going to face a lot of urgency and they haven't not taken a, a home court game from the opposing teams that they have played. They took them from the Clippers, the Thunder, and the Timberwolves. So yeah, I, I definitely have Dallas two. Celtics three though, because it, like I said, it is very hard to beat Celtics twice in a row. Truly, it truly is. Not only that, after a loss, Celtics have not have not lost. You know, obviously for the Mavericks to win the series, they're gonna need to break that chain. But I have the Celtics winning the series anyway. I don't foresee them losing. I'm taking Celtics in three again, rebounding very well from that loss. I don't think they can lose twice in a row. Game four, though, I am taking the Celtics again just because putting themselves at 2-2 with the Mavericks. Mavericks know that they have to win that game four, of course. But if the Celtics tie it up 2-2 with the Mavs, you are absolutely playing with it's any one series. They know that game is going to be the closest thing to a dagger without it literally being a dagger. Celtics winning game four would all but secure the series. Again, they, they would definitely come out saying we have more business to do. And of course they would. 3-1 isn't, you know, cemented uh, champions yet. But that game will get, provide the Celtics with an opportunity to strongly push away and, and, and put themselves in a prime position. Game five, I think the Mavericks do have fun in them. Plus, I think the Mavericks are a really good team. They should get at least two, period. And I don't think it goes to seven, again, just because experience one, Mavericks will have a very hard time dealing with the versatility of the Celtics. I don't think there's any team in the league this year who's as versatile as the Celtics. Let's uh, let's do some quick, quick uh, statistic checks here. So in the postseason, this is really cool. In the postseason, the Celtics are the second highest scoring team. Phenomenal team. We, we don't even need to, you know, get into that too much. But not only that, their defense has just been smothering. Only 101 points per game allowed. So you look at, again, their offense and their defense. You're thinking, okay, this team is complete. Now, to play devil's advocate, you could say, well, the Heat were down. Terry Rozier, Jimmy Butler, and Jaime Hakkis at some point. I think it was game three. Uh, they were also down Donovan Mitchell and, and Jared Allen when, when the Cavaliers played against the Celtics. And then you could also say, well, Tyrese Halliburton was out too. You can say, well, the Celtics you know, just had really easy opponents. It's still a very difficult thing to do to be top three in both of these. And it does show off versatility. You even want to show off differential and seeing how much the Celtics are winning by. I mean, dude, it, it's just this team... Points per game differential plus 10 in the playoffs. That is just, that is amazing. <laughs> it's nothing short of amazing. Look what they're limiting limiting their opponents to. 33% field goal percentage. Great defense. Obviously, Magic being at 28 isn't saying much because they played the Cavs. <laughs> of course, the Celtics played the Cavs, but they also did play the Pacers and did play the Heat. Now, that's three series. It's a much bigger sample size. But again, 33.8. Dallas is extremely depending off two things. One, those open threes because Luke is creating so much. Two, the interior paint scoring off the lobs. You want to look at what the Celtics do is they just outright limit their opponents from getting to the line. So you can, you know, you can do your best to rely on the lobs. The problem is two points... You know, on your way down and on your way back. If you're not going to get to the free throw line, again, teams are just not getting to the free throw line against the Celtics. If you're not going to be able to shoot threes consistently and you're solely depending off, again, those lobs, because that's that's a threat. They're not going to allow Luka to beat them. You know, of course, Luka is going to be great and do his best to create for himself, but they're just not going to allow Luka to beat them. That's why Carrie is the X factor, because you can double Luka 
you can force Luka to pass the ball out and try to have your rotations pure enough to where you can kind of close out on some threes and force the Mavericks to make some shots. But the Celtics are versatile enough to be able to, again, limit the three-point opportunities uh, in terms of attempts and percentage. But what they can't do is they they can't really do anything about Kyrie if he's going off because if you double Kyrie, well, guess what? Luke is going to have a lot more ample opportunity. If you let Luke op open things up, you're in big, big trouble. But at the same time as well, if Kyrie is going off and you want to, again, double him and double Luka, then you're really allowing three-point opportunities for the Mavericks. Ultimately, my reason comes down to experience. It comes down to just complete roster. Again, position from one through five. Every Celtic player can shoot. Every Celtic player fulfills a role to a T. And you have your two definitive stars who are not only really good on offense, are really good at defense, adding on to Derek White and Drew Holiday being all defensive players. And then again, a healthy Kristaps Sporzingis, you're adding a lengthy defender, you know, someone who can definitely get beat on a post-up, but the Mavericks centers aren't good at post-ups. They're good at finishing at the rim off of lobs and not for more so gimmies, but they're not going to you know, push you down and punish you like a Shaquille O'Neal kind of guy. Even like a poor man Shaquille O'Neal is the point I'm trying to make. They're just not going to be doing that thing. They're going to be very reliant on Luka opening things up, per usual, of course. But the Celtics, again, they're going to be hounding. And it's very difficult to get to the free throw line against the, against the Celtics team because, again, for one, they're just great defenders. Two, they allow the least free throw attempts per game Three, because they're disciplined, they're smart, they know what they're doing. And opponents just haven't gotten their three-point shot going against them because their rotations are super fast. The Celtics allow the lowest, you know, corner threes in all of playoffs. Why? It's because those corner threes are typically your swing outs to wide open guys. Problem is, is Celtics don't rely on double teams as much as other teams. They're just so, so skilled on the defensive end, they, they aren't they aren't as, as dependent on it like a Timberwolves team where, let's be honest, as good as Rudy Gobert is defensively, he was getting picked on. They were looking for that. You know, Luka was going in and Rudy Gobert would also help out on the help side. And I thought, I truly believe that the Timberwolves would be better at kind of rotating around, but they just didn't have it. And it was, you know, getting tired late in games. Cat was fouling every two seconds. And this Celtics team just doesn't make stupid fouls, to be honest, like the Timberwolves have. They have experience in this spot. Now, Mavericks, again, are a very good team. I easily take them taking two games. I say easily, but it could be one. It's possible Celtics win in five, but I'm definitely saying Celtics in six just because those fourth quarter moments, it is, it is extremely difficult to say, all right, team, we have to let Kyrie do his thing because Kyrie, Kyrie is going to show up. It is going to be very difficult for the Celtics to double Kyrie because then, you know, it opens things up for Luka and Co. And the Celtics, sorry, and the Mavericks love swinging the ball around because what does that mean? It means that it's getting to Luka's hand and Luka can facilitate for that final shot in terms of whether it's a lob or the open pass to a three where someone's just open. Luka's vision is deadly. It is deadly. I'm just going to bank more on a more consistent offense from the Celtics and a far more skilled defense on the Celtics. Because let's be honest, Celtics and Mavericks, in terms of paper per player in a vacuum, just way better defenders from top to bottom. What Mavericks do really well is they scheme. Jason Kidd has done a phenomenal job at being a defensive coordinator, coming up with perfect plans. Again, you look at that terrible series, just, just forcing Cat to be great, forcing other players aside from Ant to do something. You know, that's why Nas Reed had some really clutch games. Is they were forcing anyone but Ant. With the Celtics, I mean, let's be honest. Jalen Brown is for the moment. Jason Tatum is a superstar. You want to get it to Drew, Drew Holiday, who's a championship player? You want to get it to Derek White? Like, Derek White what, is a 40% three-point shooter? Chris Alsorzingis, who's a proven scorer? It's, it's, not, it's not the same. It's not the same for the Mavericks. They're dealing with a whole different beast wholeheartedly believe that this series ends in six but it could be five let me know what you guys think i think this is awesome though for basketball good time to be a fan because you got a one seed but you also got a five seed you got a five seed that you know is relying on two 
superstar players in Kyrie and Luka. And then you, you, you know, you see what they do in the fourth quarters. It's special. It's special. So we'll see. I'm looking forward to it. Let me know your prediction. As always, though, I appreciate you guys for watching. This is Ollie Been Different. All we've been different. And we out.